Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the Skubana e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. Skubana is a platform to manage your entire e-commerce operation. Today, we have Jason Boyce. He's co-founder and CEO of Dazadee.com. They sell home recreational products, including basketball hoops, game tables, fitness equipment, bikes, and much more. He has over 13 years of e-commerce experience and started Dazadee.com in 2002 with his three brothers. They have over 10,000 products on their site. And the amazing thing is they have 100,000 SKUs in queue. Jason, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Jeremy. It's such a pleasure to be here. It's such an honor that you would uh, have me on your show. Yeah, I'm excited to chat because you have a wealth of knowledge. Um, and I always like to start with a fun fact. And sure. you have a couple fun facts. One is you did some a lot of kickboxing. How did you get into kickboxing and, and why did you stop? Well, you know, being a being a small business owner and an entrepreneur can be very frustrating at times. So I looked for an outlet to sort of channel that uh, angst out. Um, and you know, as a younger man, um, I found a really excellent teacher in, in downtown LA, and um, I had always been involved in martial arts, both in the Marine Corps uh, before in the Marine Corps, during and after. And um, you know, I I just really really felt drawn to it and connected with it. So Sounds dangerous. Yeah, yeah well, I have uh, you know, my nose is more crooked than it used to be. Uh, I have uh, some scar tissue, broken ribs. Wow. Um, so it, it was the real deal. I would I would get into the ring with in, in, the sparring partner. Some of them were ex-convicts. <laughs> really? One guy, one guy his name was Pedro. I'm not going to say his last name to protect him, but his his uh the way he earned his living was he would siphon gasoline out of gasoline stations. Wow. And that's how he earned his living. So I was, you know, here I was running a multi-million dollar e-commerce company in the room with him. Um, and uh, most of the time he got the better of me, but it was, it was, Who has you been your was toughest, just, who's been your toughest opponent? Oh, um, you know, my toughest opponent was a professional fighter. He was a professional kickboxer. Wow. Um, and uh, he, he's the one that gave me the scar above my eye here <laughs> and, and one of my several broken noses. Wow. Um, yeah, his name was Joe, just a great down-to-earth guy. But it was so amazing because we would all go in there and it didn't matter where we came from and we'd do this very physical thing and then yeah. we'd get the ring and we'd give each other a hug and, 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 okay. and a high five. Right. It was just a really good outlet for me at the time. I'm, I'm a little too old and when I got married, my wife... <laughs> I'm a little too old now. My wife said, you know, with your business, you kind of really need your brain. Um, and I'm not so sure it's a good idea that Pedro's kicking at it constantly. She sounds so. like such a nice person. She put it so like, so nice. <laughs> She's amazing. She truly is my better half and I married her for sure. So, you know, one thing in my research, obviously you started the company with your three brothers and I noticed that you have different last names. We do. Um, so I, I refer to them as my uh, my second family. In my teen years, uh, their family and their their mother and father, Barb and Ken, took me in uh, and and taught me parts of life that I didn't have the opportunity to learn growing up as a kid. Um, so I, I I'm going to talk about um, you know one of the one of the books that I wanted to talk about is Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad Poor Dad. It's mm -hmm. one of that I read that got me involved in this doing business for yourself anyway. Mm -hmm. and I really connected with it because of the two fathers. So mm. I have a biological father who um, who I love dearly, um, and I also have my my Jewish soul father, uh, <laughs> Ken Kloristenfeld. So he's uh, been an inspiration to me and and really helped fill in some gaps in my learning. And and I I just you know once they invited me to dinner one time I just never left. <laughs> One Shabbos dinner didn't, didn't want to leave. <laughs> you would uh, leave ours, I tell you that, with all the yelling. <laughs> but um, what was life like when they? <laughs> what was life like when they took you in? Well, uh, you know, I was struggling. I was a, I was a teenager. I was a little bit lost. I'd lost my way. Um, you know, I was mixed up in some things that I shouldn't be in, and, and was heading my tra my trajectory was heading in the wrong direction, mm. and. Um, you know, my brother, Elon and Josh, their father grabbed me by the shoulders and said, what are you doing to yourself? Mm. And, uh, 
And I said, what do you mean? And, you know, they just kind of took me in and there was no judgment. There was nothing but, you know, unconditional love and support from them. And they helped me sort of find my way again. And ironically, um, you know, sitting at the at the dinner table all those years, the dinner table is how we started this business. Yeah. So and, and I just love them so much and I wanted to stay close to them. And so uh, going into business with them was the next logical step. Yeah. Jason, I'm really touched by that. That sounds really amazing. I mean, at the time, you're young, you're a teenager. Did you take to that advice like a mature person? I mean, I think I would have been like, screw you or something. I don't know. How, how did you react to his advice? Well, you know, that that's the remarkable part is because I've never met uh, a person with such patience and love for, for fellow humans. Mm -hmm. and, and I did exactly what you described. You know, I didn't take it easily. Mm -hmm. um, at first I felt, uh, you know, I, I felt like a special connection. I felt, okay, you know, this will, you know, I'll probably come to dinner a few times and that'll be that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll move on to my, you know, nefarious ways. <laughs> and um, they just didn't, they just never judged. Even when I was resistant, they stuck in there with me. Yeah. And, um, you know, both of my fathers, uh, both, uh, you know, Dr. K, as we call him, I, I call him JB, it's his uh, nickname, and, uh, and my own father, both of them taught me grit, and grit is mm. such an important, critical component yeah. if you're going to found your own business and, and keep it going. Yeah. And you, you joined the Marines. So tell me about your experience with the Marines. Uh, what a great experience. Um, I joined the Marines. I was... I was just finishing up my business degree at Cal State Northridge, mm -hmm. uh, this degree in finance. Yeah. And, um, I, you know, I, I, I wasn't ready to join the corporate world. They were really do, they do a great job. It's a terrific business school in, in the Valley in Los Angeles. Yeah. And they do a great job of preparing you for, you know, sort of the corporate world. And I just wasn't ready. And I, I knew the, the education was excellent. And I knew I was still missing a piece mm. of my own development. Yeah. I was walking one day near the student union and I saw an Inc. magazine cover and on the cover of the Inc. magazine was a was a marine officer in dress blue uniform and it said the best MBA in America. Hmm. So I picked up the article and read it and the next day I was talking to the uh, recruiter from the Marine Corps and I, I, it's a special program. The Marines are unique in this way. Um, if you don't do ROTC in college, you, you know, you can still go to college and, and be a college student and mm -hmm. do all the fun things. And then after your degree, you can go to what's called officer candidate school and they'll make you a commissioned officer in the Marines. Mm -hmm. It's a 10 week course followed by a six month training course. And then after that, you go to your specialty training. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, it really woke me up. It really took whatever boundaries I had on what I felt I could accomplish, mm -hmm. blew them up didn't stretch them it literally obliterated them because they ask so much of you yeah. that, that you, you just don't think you can do it but when you get to the other side and you accomplish it and you look back and go wow I didn't think I could do that but I did it mm. and it just really gave me a lot of confidence and, and excellent leadership training I think it's some of the best leadership training in the country yeah. so Jason what was one of those examples that you blew through one of your boundaries that you didn't think you could accomplish well I, I didn't sleep for a week really once. are you serious we, we I hear had, that's like su that's super dangerous. We had this training evolution. Uh, it was called the War. It was towards the end of the basic school, which is a six month training course. Yeah. And uh, I had the honor of being put in charge of our platoon. And there was just so much to do that I, I, it wasn't my plan. I, I planned on sleeping a couple hours every day out in the woods, yeah. Yeah. but it just didn't work out. And I, I didn't sleep. And well, I think on day four, without any sleep, it was the middle of the night and I was laying some wire. We were doing this defensive operation. I was laying some wire to communicate with my other commanders. And I started to have a conversation with this guy who was standing there. I didn't know who it was. But I'm having this, you know, detailed conversation about how the mission's going and, you know, what we're learning and how great it is. And, uh, and then, I, and then I, I stop and I, I look again and I reach out and I touch this person. But it's not a person. It's a tree. So delirious by day four. Yeah. I was to a tree. So, yeah, that's crazy. You know, sleep is required. I don't recommend anyone go without sleep for a week, but right. you know, in certain circumstances, and I've done it with my business. You know, you just pull in a couple right. of hours, and I, hopefully, I'm not at a place where I have to do that anymore. But that's just one, you know, yeah. small example of where yeah. you really find out what you're physically and mentally. Yeah. Capable. So, what's another, Jason? That's that's fascinating. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I'm going to make the whole interview about no about the Marines. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you a short story about when I was in officer candidate school. Um, I had I was not prior enlisted, so I had and I and I didn't do my homework in one specific area. I didn't learn how to drill march individuals. So I was one of the first uh, leaders picked in my platoon during officer candidate school, which is a boot camp environment. Uh, the only difference in officer candidate school from boot camp environment, at some point after the drill instructors have been leading it, they hand it over to you and say, okay, they, they pick someone and they picked me and I, you know, I was terrified uh, and, and I had to learn to drill. Uh, you, know, you, you march to the chow hall, you march to all the different training evolutions that you do in a given day. And I marched my platoon right into a wall. <laughs> I would, yeah, I have a horrible sense of direction. I would march them worse places, yeah. You know, I couldn't figure out my left from my right. And, you know, and some of the guys that were in my platoon were seasoned Marines. They had been sergeants and staff sergeants and corporals in the Marine, and they were just cringing. Um, and so I, I just really felt like I couldn't figure it out. But I had a couple of, it, it wasn't even the drill instructors that helped me. I mean, they were, you know, yelling at me non-stop while I was doing just this the worst job of anyone in history at the officer candidate school, I'm convinced. But a couple of those senior guys came over and said, look, you know, candidate voice, you, you got to do this. And they kind of took me under their wing and showed me how to do it. And, yeah. and later that day, I was already doing it properly. And so just the whole concept of you can't do it now, but with a little bit of help, and a little bit of patience and a little bit of fortitude, you can figure it out later. Mm -hmm. There are just you know hundreds of examples of that where mm -hmm. I would screw up and recover quickly. Yeah. So you know that, that's that's another example of the Marine. It's just a great experience. Anyone who's interested in the military, I would highly recommend going to college first and doing something like this, especially if they have if they feel that they're a leader and they have some natural ability to lead. Mm -hmm. Going here will really solidify yeah. that. So Jason, take me back to, you're on the dinner table. You're with Ari, Alan, Josh, the, the discussion around the, the first inception of Dazzity. I love this story. I love, I love what happened. It's such a seminal moment for us. Hmm. Uh, Brother Ari, who's incidentally, he's, not, he's no longer with the company. Yeah. The grind of doing the e-commerce business was uh, something that he just wasn't interested in any longer and he moved on to greener pastures. Yeah. But it was Ari's idea, and you have to understand, hmm. There's four brothers, there's, um, and then there's me. Um, and Ari is just the coolest cat you've ever met. Never gets excited. You could say, Ari, um, you know, the building's on fire. Ari would go, oh, really? Let me, let me grab a cup of coffee and I'll see you guys outside. <laughs> now, he doesn't get panicked or get ruffled. And he, he hung around the sort of the Rastafarian crowd in high school and was very mellow. And so Ari brings up this idea at the table. Hey, uh, family, uh, I'm going to start a new business. It's going to be an e-commerce business. And I'm thinking about selling basketball hoops. And it was all his idea. Um, and everyone at the table, I was actually home on leave. I was still in the Marine Corps, but I was getting towards the end of my four, year, four years. Yeah. And... Everyone at the table go, oh, Ari, that's hilarious. You know, what? you can't, you can't start. It. Come on, you, uh, you can't keep a job right now. So what's, what are you doing? And so I looked Ari in the eye and I said, I'm getting out of the Marines in three weeks. Let's do it together. I think it's a great idea, and I think e-commerce is the future, and I think we can really make a go at this thing. So. And then everyone started laughing at me. Oh, that's funny, yeah. <laughs> and then shortly, uh, younger brother Josh, who by the way was in high school and wrote our first database and, and website, he was a junior. Josh joined shortly after, and without him, it never would have launched. And and then soon after that, Elon. So Elon and Josh are still with us. Mm -hmm. Still integral parts, co-founders. And uh, and, El and Elon joined us, and he was just getting out of the college frat scene and said, "You got to sell game tables." You know, I, my, my frat house had a pool table, a foosball table. We got to get into this. And so he's the one that brought that to the table. And it's, it remains one of our, our best-selling categories. So you get back three weeks later. What do you do first? Well, I, I get back to the Marines. And after, you know, every night when I was going home, I was online doing research. So we wanted to make sure that basketball hoops was the right fit. So. Yeah. We made a long list, as long as my arm, of things that we loved doing. Mm -hmm. You know, Shabbos at the at, at the house was all about backgammon, basketball, games, everything that we could do without television. I want to be invited. Yeah. 
Yeah, you come on, <laughs> anytime. <laughs> the door is always open. Um, and so we loved doing those things. So we made a long list of all of those things that we love to do. And we, we started surfing the net. Um, I, I don't even think we were using Google at the time to surf. <laughs> I can't even remember. I, you know, I think maybe CompuShare. I don't even know what. This was like 2002 ish. 2002. Yeah. yeah, 2002. So we looked at all the existing e commerce sites for all those products that we love to sell. And we basketball hoops, there were a couple of guys that were really good, but we thought, you know what? I think we could take these guys. I think we can do this. Yeah. We know the sport. We love the sport. We're passionate about it, and we can grow it from there. So you have no, I mean, neither of you have experienced selling e-commerce or basketball hoops. So, so what do you do? It, it didn't start off at the name Dazzity either. No, no. Ari came up with the name Super Duper Hoops, which I'm still absolutely in love with. I like Super that. Name. Yeah. It's a great name. And in 2004, we changed it to Dazzity. And the reason why we did it is because we hired a very good uh, intellectual property attorney in Los Angeles. He, we were basically a pro bono case for him because we were so small compared. He was doing. He's still working with multi-billion-dollar multinational companies. Right. But uh, so we we met with him and we said we want to trademark Super Duper Hoops and he had a very frank discussion with us and he said, guys, you know, the good news is is I can get you the trademark so you can protect it. The bad news is you'll be my biggest client. <laughs> <laughs> so. So we said, got it, Jorge. Jorge Arseniegas, Arseniegas is his name, and he's just amazing. He's a, he's a mensch. He's a great, great, great attorney and really has helped us steer the, steer the company. Um, so, so we came up with the name, you know, Dazzity. So. so, Jason, now, what was working well So with the inception of Super Duper Hoops? And then what mistakes did you make early on that you wish you would have avoided? Well, you know, the environment was such when we launched that it was really hard to make a mistake. Really? Yeah. So we launched on May 28th, 2002. We launched the website at around 10 a.m. in the morning. By noon, we had sold two hoops. Really? You know, by the afternoon, we'd sold four hoops. Wow. Um, by, you know, and, 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 you know, just so you know, our infrastructure to start the company, we started at uh, Ari's apartment in downtown LA. Right. And he didn't have a working computer. So we had, you know, I took my last paycheck from the Marine Corps and bought Ari a computer. Uh, it was like $1,000. W- within 24 hours, we had already earned back the money to, to, to pay off our initial investment. So we had a, a dropship relationship uh, uh, where we put the product up on the site, we sold the product. Sent the order to mm. our new friends, and they shipped it directly to the customer's home. And that's how we were able to start this business with no no capital. And at the time, something else that was working beautifully was pay per click advertising. Mm. PPC. Mm-hmm. I believe the name of the company that we first started with was Overture. Later, bought by Yahoo. Right. And they- Google worked out an arrangement with them and sort right. of dominated right. that space. But yeah. we were paying a nickel a click. You know, the percentage of the sale for marketing was well under 5%, and it was really hard to lose money. You know? yeah. So, so it, it, was almost, it was almost too easy for the first year. First half, you know, the first, we started in May, so half a year we did 100000 in revenue the first year. The next year we did a million. Wow. Oh, holy did, cow. So the environment was really, really good. It's amazing. So <laughs> when did you expand Beyond Basketball Hoops? So basketball hoops was actually our first category. Right. Super, super hoops dot com yeah. was the first website. Yeah. About six months later, we launched super duper games dot com, mm-hmm. and then super duper scooters and super duper baseball. And it wasn't until two thousand four we kind of merged them all together under the Dazzity name. So what were some of the best sellers after the basketball hoops? Because obviously you go from a hundred thousand to a million. That's a huge, you know, you're ten times jump. Yeah. Um, we kept pinching ourselves, and in the back of my mind, I'm like, "Something's not right here. This is uh, this is too easy." Too easy, yeah. Something, something is coming, and uh, sure enough, plenty came after that. Um, you know, everyone learned about PPC, nickel click, and it's a bidding process, so the prices for PPC went up, 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 up. Pretty soon, that five percent or less of the sales started becoming 10, 15, 30 percent of the sale, and when your profit margin is 40 to 30 percent, if you're paying 30 and then always up to 50, sometimes 60% of the sale. It's just the math doesn't add up any longer. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, so what was the next phase? So you expanded from the Super Duper Hoops to Super Duper Games. Um, Yeah. Yeah, so what uh, what did you find was doing really well and what things did you have to maybe think about dropping? 
Well, we didn't think about dropping anything. Hmm. Um, we uh, everything that we went up with started selling right away. Uh, it was just kind of the wild west. The, the irony is, it was after the dot com bust. So when we were going to vendors at trade shows and saying, we think we can sell your stuff online, they were all laughing at us because the bust happened and the right. internet was a failed experiment. And we're like, yeah, we think maybe, you know, you guys had a rough patch, but we think this thing may have legs. Give us a shot. Let us sell your product. Yeah. And we can prove to you that, you know, we can be a valued vendor for you. So we, we just kept adding, adding, adding. Game Tables was the next site and... We started selling arcade games, which was something we still sell, which is one of my fun, you know, most fun mm. products. Uh, arcade Legends, Miss um, Pac-Man, Galaga, all those great 80s. My wife's favorite, Miss Pac-Man, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> so let's talk offline, I'll get you. <laughs> um, so what was the next major milestone? So, like, right after, obviously, you see PPC, you know, the, the competitors kind of pile on. What did you do? to then shift to compensate for that? So we, we kind of went into sort of a dark period. Um, we, we didn't compensate quickly enough. Um, the, the prices of pay-per-click advertising kept increasing. Our costs of goods was increasing. Shipping crisis, prices was increasing. And the downward pressure provided by the internet was pushing prices down. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. every day, every month, we would look at the numbers. Costs were going up, prices were going down. It was it, it wasn't very it wasn't a very good situation. So we had a number of years where we just weren't making any money. We were breaking even. We we, we were still growing and still selling items, but the it, profit it, it was, margin was diminished. It was a real challenge. And one of the milestones that changed that for us, we got a phone call from Amazon, and Amazon said. We're going to start offering people like you to sell your products on our website. And it, and <laughs> we were sitting around actually my three in one poker table, which was my dining table in my bachelor days. <laughs> <laughs> I like we're that. Yeah. Around the table, uh, you know, Elon and Josh and Ari and I are all having a meeting about the business. It was, you know, pre Shabbos business meeting. And, um, we have very detailed conversation. We're talking about these struggles that we're having, what to do. And we're, the meeting is about to wrap up. And Ari goes, oh, yeah, by the way, I forgot to tell you guys, it's not a big deal, but Amazon called us. And we're like, what? Amazon called? What? Why are you just bringing that up? The meeting's over. And he brought up the fact that Amazon called and they wanted us to sell basketball hoops. And I said, give me the number. We're calling them back right now. Yeah. And ironically, we were one of the first guys selling on Amazon wow. basketball hoops. I think we sold basketball hoops on Amazon before Amazon was selling basketball hoops, actually. Wow. Because they had opened up the marketplace to so many other categories. And so the marketplace has been a great thing for us. It's a continued source of growth for us. Mm -hmm. And that price that we pay uh, for sort of a acquisition fee is fixed. So that's something we can work with. Unlike the pay-per-click advertising where the it's a very it's a variable cost. Right. It wasn't even variable in both directions. It was variable all the way up until right. the point where you could really literally go out of business if you were paying too much for your advertising. Yeah. So what did you see? What have you seen that's worked well on Amazon than what has not? Because you've been in since the beginning. We have. We were in from the beginning and I... I I'm so envious of Jeff Bezos and what he's created over there. Not just in the marketplace, but his own site, the cloud. We're now, all of our infrastructure is in the Amazon's cloud, mm -hmm. which is just a revelation for us. Yeah. We get the 2 a.m. phone calls about the servers going down in downtown L.A., you know. So um, what he, he's, a, he's a huge inspiration to me, read his books. Um, so we've learned a tremendous amount. I mean, on some level, Amazon has been a teacher for us. Mm -hmm. And and it's and it continues to work. And one of the things that we also do, uh, it's a growing part of our business, is we're sending inventory truckloads to Amazon through their fulfillment by Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, I was very skeptical about it when we started using it because it's their customer, and we don't basically get to remarket to that customer. But when they when they offer to allow our products that are in their warehouse to be listed as Prime. Prime shipping, so it's right. the free two-day shipping, and yeah. it's up here in you know in Seattle, it's a one-day shipping. Um, we saw a big lift in, in revenue. Really, it made, it made it worth it for us. So that's been a nice surprise. It's a it's um, taught us 
how to buy inventory rather than do dropship. We're making a big push over the last couple of years to, to inventory more of our items. Um, and, and, and it, you know, the marketplaces are, are really big drivers to the site. We also have a benefit because we've been around a long time. We've been around 13 years now. I mean, in e-commerce, it's like dog years. You might as well have been right. around years. Yeah. And, and so we've built up a lot of history. So we have a lot of organic traffic that comes to the website. Um, and we, we do some stuff like affiliate marketing also where that price per sale is fixed mm -hmm. and Google, uh, PLAs, the product listing ads. We've had, we've had some success with them. We, we turned off things like some of the other consumer, uh, c comparison shopping engines because it became the same bidding process where the, the, the cost per sale was too great. We couldn't cover it with our profit margin. And even when we were remarketing to those customers, we weren't getting it back until very, far in the future. So mm -hmm. we're, we're doing very little CSE, we're doing very little PPC. And, and those are the areas that are really, really driving traffic for us. Yeah. And then, you know, when the customer comes to the site or they buy it from one of the other channels, we're, we're on walmart.com, sears.com. Um, we're doing a little bit in eBay, buy.com, which is now Rakuten. So when, when they see us on all those marketplaces and they have a good experience, they, they come back and maybe they'll tell a friend or two. So mm -hmm. it's, been, it's been much better than I was anticipating when I was, uh, you know, we, had, we, we, we did the pluses and minuses things when it was time to launch with Amazon and the pluses far outweigh the negatives. Mm -hmm. And even some of the negatives have gone away. I, we really do think it's been a driver to our, yeah. to our website. So Jason, obviously you said FBA has been huge in, you know, with prime customers. What else has surprised you that's worked on Amazon? You know, at, at, this, page, at this stage, after doing this for 13 years, I'm, I don't have too many more surprises. <laughs> I, I'm always, uh, I always enjoy when we do have surprises, but yeah. FBA, I think for sure was the biggest yeah. thing. I thought that it was going to be the ruin of our business. Uh, I was one of the brothers who thought that it was going to be the ruin of our, everyone else was doing the I told you so dance when it worked out really well. Right. But, um, you know, so, so that was a big one. And also the idea of carrying inventory has been something that has been huge for us. A wise, a wise jewelry dealer once told me, Jason, you don't make your money when you sell your product. You make your money when you buy your product. And I'm scratching my head going, what are you talking that about? That seems weird, yep. I don't, I don't understand, but it's, it's quite simple. Um, if you buy at the right price and you buy in the right quantity mm. compared to what the market retail price is and you have a cushion for profit margin, that's, that's, the, best way, that's the best way to make money. Um, one of the things that I can you know, tell your viewers, someone who out there who's maybe thinking about starting an e-commerce company or who's maybe been struggling getting an e-commerce company off the ground yeah. is there's a lot of noise out there. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and the noise that you hear, if you're, a, I read a lot and I follow things like CNBC, Bloomberg, Business Week, all the big guys, right? One thing that you must understand if you're a founder and you're, you're bootstrapped in a company is that if they make a decision, it's not always the best course of action to follow what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you a prime example. Yeah. A company like Amazon, if they want to gain market share, they may sell a product where they're losing money on it. And it's perfectly fine and capable for them to do that because they're eating up market share, they're holding on to that customer, and they're remarketing to that customer. Yeah. Good for you, Amazon. And when they lose enough money, they have the type of investor base. And when you're selling your stock over $500 a stock, a share, if you're losing money, you can just go sell some more shares and bring in the money to cover those losses or right. you can sell corporate bonds or any other number of financing options. Right. If you're bootstrapping your company and you're losing money on a SKU, you cannot make it up. There's no amount of capital that's available to you right now that will allow you to survive that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we, we've had two near-death experiences, uh, probably yeah. more, two very pronounced Yeah, ones. tell me about it, yeah. One, one is in 2008 when, you know, the world was coming to an end. <laughs> right. The, the whole financial markets were cratering. Our, our product is very highly discretionary, which means you don't need a foosball table to screw. You don't? Okay. I, I mean, we have some customers. Unless you're a fret. Disagree yeah. with that statement. But, but, you know, you don't need it. So... 
you know, when you're worried about losing your job or the world's, you know, financial system is going to crater, you don't go out and buy a foosball table. You save your money for things that you need, like food and important things. Um, so, you know, w when the stock market started tanking in 2008, sales stopped. It was just we could hear wow, crickets. Really? We could hear, we could hear crickets in the office. Everyone stopped buying because it was just sort of this mass panic. I stopped buying too. You know, we all stopped buying things, and we understood why. So. We, that was our first round of layoffs, which uh, as an entrepreneur and as a business person is the hardest thing you can mm. do. We laid off about 70% of our workforce. We shut down a big warehouse that we were operating, mm. moved into a 700 square foot office. We crammed about five or six people in the office and it was really uncomfortable. But that's what we did. And that's what yeah. we had, you know, had to do to survive. Yeah. 2013 was another year where we really it was it was much worse than 2008. As bad as things were in really? 2013, 2013 was our worst year on record. In the year 2013, we lost one million dollars at the wow. end. Wow! And, and we were talking to the bankruptcy attorneys. We were talking to everyone. And now, how did we get to this point? Well, we started listening to the voices and the noise, and what you have to do to become a successful e-commerce company. You have to have a certain member of staff. You have to have a fancy office space. And we put a bunch of money in redesigning a very cool office space in West Hills um, so that we could attract talent. Um, and we started going after market share. And there were when we finally fixed our reporting so that we could see the 360 degree view of all of our costs down to the order level, mm. you know, um, Sally, Sally Smith in Utah buying a table tennis table, we see all the costs that went into that order and, and, and what we received for that order. We had about half a dozen SKUs uh, that Grand Total had lost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Wow. We sold them and the quantity was big, but we were losing money on every sale and we had lost hundreds of thousands of dollars. On top of that, our overhead was bloated compared to what we were, what, you know, what we were generating in revenue. Um, it, it, it was a disaster. I thought it was the end. Uh, my brothers and I sat around uh, at the end of November and said, or I should say at the end of December and said, you know, the, a big holiday season is not going to help us. Mm. Uh, we either need to file for bankruptcy or, or do something else. And uh, my, my brothers put on the table the, what we called the nuclear option, going back to the apartment, um, cutting our cost and, and, and coming back to it. And, and it was at that point that I realized that a company like ours that's bootstrapping ourselves can't chase that sale. Yeah, can't go after market share because you're out, you're you're out capitalized, and you're out expertised, <laughs> if that's a word. Yeah. And so at that very moment, and and, and I got to tell you, I heard the words, I'd heard the words for ten years prior to that. I knew that we couldn't be a market share without going out and having an IPO or having big capital backing us or big investors. But losing that, when you look at your P&L, your profit and loss statement at the end of the year, and you see that that's a million dollars, that is a great lesson. Negative, yeah. <laughs> that is what taught me that we can't chase that market share. And we immediately began flipping to a profit share, profit-driven strategy. Yeah. Um, buying the inventory like I talked about was one of the key elements of that because the drop shippers, you know, when you drop ship something, A, the, the people that are shipping to your customer don't have as much of a stake in your customer as you do, and B, it costs them a lot more money to do that, so you're paying more for it, right? Yeah. You don't get any kind of volume scale or quantity breaks. So it, 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 it really is a great way to start a business without capital, or at least it was in 2002. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't know if you can do that anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so that, just to sort of, you know, uh, put some bookends on, on that piece to share with your viewers who are in e-commerce now or yeah. bootstrapping their company, focus on the profit. Yeah. Don't listen to CNBC. Don't listen to Bloomberg Business Week where these guys are going after market share because unless you have an IPO, unless your stock price is $500 a share and you can go sell stock and raise capital you know, by the bucket load, right. that is not a good strategy for you and it will, it will end up in your ruin. Yeah. Uh, you know, by the skin of our teeth, we survived. But it, it was almost too late for us. And if yeah. I can share anything, please, you know, viewers, remember that. <laughs> yeah. No, Jason, I appreciate you sharing that. And I want to talk about after that happened, what change, what, what changes you did make. But before you said there's, there's six SKUs that were losing money. What was it about it that was losing money? Because um, obviously you're selling them. Was it just 
you were buying too high? What was what were the factors in there? Yeah, I think every question that just popped into your head, the answer is yes. <laughs> it wasn't just one thing; it yeah. was all of them. Um, one, you know, the the cost was too high. Um, the shipping costs were too high. Uh, that's that's something that you know on the online world has become a must-have. You must offer free shipping. So, yeah. so shipping has become a, above the line for us. Yeah. Most of goods for us now, right? So our shipping costs were out of out of check. Um, you know, the, the cost of the goods were out of check. Even some of the marketing efforts that we we, we had hired a very uh, very talented uh, six figure person to come in and run our marketing efforts, and it seems like they'd spent more money than they brought in. Um, and so that that was another piece of it. So all in the cost of goods, the shipping expense, the um, the, the the price we were paying to the marketplaces, as well as our own merchant fees when the sales yeah. were coming through our own site. Yeah. And then the cost to drive that sale were, were just too high. Yeah. And how do how do we do that? You think, well, that's just dumb, Jason. Why why'd you do that? Well, you get you get hooked into I gotta sell more. Right. You, it, I asked really you that to break it down, Jason, because I guarantee you this is so common that you just want to get that sale and those specific items of costs yeah. get lost. It, you're a hundred percent right. And and the reporting that we had in place, there there isn't a lot of off you know over the counter stuff out there that focuses on cost down to that level. Mm -hmm. And so what we did with with Josh's help, who's our develop guru, mm -hmm. is we built a reporting system that will show us all of those costs. We get um, I check that report every day. I can see every sale on every SKU and every order mm. and know what the profit margin is on it. And if it's a negative or it's a red number then we're raising the price and either pulling the product, raising the price, and mm -hmm. or going back to the vendor and the shipping uh, vendor and saying, we're out of the market here. If you want this volume to continue, we have to get better pricing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that when you're when you're bootstrapping your company, you can't lose product. Yeah. You can't lose money on a sale. Yeah. And, and you know, there are some people out there, well, you need loss leaders to get people in. I don't even have loss leaders anymore. We don't mm -hmm. even do that. If I can't make a profit on it and sell it, it's not on the site. Yeah. It's just not on the site. Yeah. So is this software internal or is it something that you offer to other, other uh, e-commerce businesses? No, I, I'm sorry to say we don't offer it to others, um, but we, we built it internally only because it just, we couldn't, the, the, there's software out there for sure that I know will do it, but yeah. not price range. Yeah. So we didn't have any choice. We yeah. just had to build it ourselves. And it took us about four months to build it. But it's uh, it's one of the reasons why we went from a million dollar loss in 2013 to 20 percent top line growth and 1,000 percent profit growth, and we made several hundred thousand in, in 2014. Yeah. yeah. So, what systems and software do you use that people should think about? Obviously, all businesses are different, but um, yeah. just to give people an idea. Well, you know. We were really, really lucky because we have a, a genius software programmer in the family. Right. <laughs> Josh, by the way, Josh's nickname is the Beave because he was like, <laughs> leave it to Beaver when we were growing up. He was so curious, always had great questions and just, you know, you look at him as a, as a young boy and he's just pure goodness. He was just like, leave it to Beaver. Right. So, but that was Beave's nickname. Um, so anyway, not everyone is fortunate enough to have someone who is as talented as he is on the right. staff. Right. Right. Um, I'll, I'll give you, give you one story. Um, we were we realized when we were doing a lot of drop shipping that EDI EDI is electronic data interchange and mm -hmm. that's a way to send orders electronically to the vendor and receive things like inventory updates etc. So we were looking at service providers for EDI and Josh was on spring break from Berkeley um, and I said hey would you sit in on this call I got a call with a potential vendor for EDI we think it's going to be really helpful for our business and. Um, and, and so we're listening to the sales pitch and the features and benefits of the product and we say, how much? And they're like, well, it's going to cost you $100,000 up front and then probably you know, anywhere from ten dollars to $50,000 a year. And wow. we're like, uh, well, we can't do that. Right. <laughs> we'll have the funding to, to provide that level of cost on an ongoing basis. So Josh says, put, put them on hold. And Josh does this thing where he sits back in his chair and he kind of rolls his eyes up to the sky and he goes... I think I can build that. And so what, what do you, build what? You, you know, the EDI system, the one that these guys are selling for, you know, a million dollars. Yeah, I, 
I don't think it's that hard. I, I, I think I can build it. And I said, well, how much time is it going to take? He goes, well, I've got another week at spring break. I think I can have it done before I go back to college <laughs> at Berkeley. <laughs> and, and sure enough, he did. He built it. He wow. built this incredible system. He found a basic open source framework that wasn't working, took it, and adapted it to, to, to work it. So, so the reason why I tell you that story is because that's the kind of talent that we had homegrown. Right. So much of our systems that we use are, 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 right. are built on our own. Our front end, our, our front end of the website, the back end of the website, the API layer that we use to communicate with our database, all built with him in open source. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of software, we use some productivity software now. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we, we partner with a company called Zendesk for our customer service, which is a terrific cost-effective uh, software system. I personally use Evernote like crazy. Mm -hmm. I use High Rise. I'd be lost without High Rise, mm -hmm. uh, just to help me manage everything from my team, vendors, um, uh, and even some key key customers. Um, we we use Google Drive, which I don't know if you would consider that software, but yeah. we we have a team in the Philippines now that are doing work for us on product uploads, and we we use Google Drive constantly. I, actually, I think you sent my invite with Google Drive, so yeah. I knew exactly what that was. Yeah. <laughs> So those are those are some of the software pieces that we use. I think everything else started it's internal. Everything else yeah. started as sort of an open source platform, and then we made it our own and, and, and built our own. And when I say we, it's the royal we. Josh built it with right. His <laughs> so Jason, going back, that's a tough pill to swallow. You see a million dollar loss. So what <sighs> what changed? What what changes did you make after? Because obviously you turned things around in a big way. I think I lost ten years of my life that year. Really? Every month we're we're wrapping up the books and it's tens of thousands of dollars lost, hundred thousand dollars lost, and and it was just really really hard. I think it's a testament to my partners too. We're losing money by the truckload. Yeah. And but we're still family. Even yeah. you know, what's the no conversation one, like around the table? No one, then? No one went at each other. No yeah. one blamed each other. Um, we were nothing but supportive, and we said, "Look, you know, we've given this business a go uh, for a long time. We we believe in it. We believe that the internet is a rising tide that's lifting all boats that we are happy to, and lucky to be a part of. We can figure this out." And it just took meeting after meeting after meeting and whiteboard discussion after whiteboard discussion. To sort of pare down what was causing the problem, and and the the number one problem, I, I, actually two part number one problem was our cost. Hmm. We weren't seeing that three hundred sixty degree view down to the order level, down to the skew level, and we had too much overhead. We had a lot of really expensive staff that, mm -hmm. quite frankly, they just weren't paying for themselves. Yeah, you know, they they weren't they weren't generating an ROI. Mm -hmm. And and so when we had that, you know, that sort of come to Jesus meeting at the beginning of December, right. we sat down and we said, well, look, we can walk away from this thing that we put our heart and soul into for the last decade, or we can go nuclear, and we can shut down the office, and we can, you know, right. let let everyone go, and and we can sort of do a restart, yeah. uh, kind of clear the slate clean, and we focus. We found of all the SKUs that we had, we had tens of thousands of SKUs at the time. We pared it down to just the ones that were working. We we went after lower costs. We started inventorying. We used a third-party service for warehousing. Um, Josh built a warehouse management system so we could keep track of inventory all over the country. So we, we switched to an inventory model when we didn't have any capital to do it. Mm -hmm. We, you know, I personally made phone calls to all of the vendors, every single one of them, and said, "Look, I know we owe you a lot of money." Um, this is what we've done. We cut nine hundred thousand dollars in expense off our PL, off our budget from twenty thirteen. We will survive. If you stick with us, you'll you'll be happy. Um, and I, I give you my word that we'll pay you every single penny that we owe you. Mm. And about one third of the vendors that I spoke to said, Jay, I get it. Um, everyone has hard times. Thank you for picking up the phone and calling me. And um, we'll stick with you. You know, just pay us something every week until we can get to current. You know, we had over a million dollars in past due uh, payables to our vendors. Wow. Um, some of them said, "Adios." <laughs> we've heard this story before from e-commerce guys, and we're done with you. 
Mm. And so one of the most meaningful things that has happened to me in this business so far is I just came back from a trade show. It's the Game Tables Billiard Show mm. in Las Vegas. And I personally went up to all of the vendors that stuck with us and I, I, I apologize to them for the problems with payment. Everyone has paid off now. Everyone is current. Um, and we're even prepaying for some inventory to get the best mm. possible pricing. Mm. But I went to everyone, I, I looked them in the eye and said, thank you for hanging in there with us. We have pri prioritized your company and companies like you that stuck with us at the tough times. Yeah. We're going to quadruple your business. You are our number one focus for this year and next. Mm. And we're going to reward you now for sticking with us. And oh. so, um, It's amazing. We had to make a lot of hard discussions. There were a lot of tears in those meetings. Yeah, what was the hardest discussion you think? Uh, easily the hardest discussion is we've got to let, let our staff go. Mm. Yeah. We can't survive and support them. Um, you know, we either let them go now, or we go bankrupt, and we let them go when we can't pay their paycheck. You know? right. So that that was the hardest discussion. So we we build very intense relationships, deep relationships with our staff, and yeah. we love them. Even the ones that weren't performing and doing well, we just love our people and yeah. we treat them like family. We're a family business, and that was I literally was crying when we were when we had that discussion when we let them all go that day. It was a dark day. And, um, you know, I, I had recommendation letters ready for all of them. Uh, when, you know, when we, when we finished up our final paperwork, I, I focused uh, with them uh, for the, the, the previous, you know, the, the following three to four months to make sure they had all found uh, work, help them know what to ask for. Um, and we, we stuck with them. It wasn't just to sort of, you know, cut the cord and forget about them. Yeah. And uh, they all got work and they all were making more money than they were making with us anyway. So it all worked out well. <laughs> That, that, was that is a tough thing. time. I, I'm, I'm getting emotional just thinking about yeah. it because such, you know, these people were not only workers, uh, they were they were family and, and telling right. that we let them down was, uh, I'll never forget that. And I, yeah. I hope I don't have to do that again. Yeah, that is tough, you know, especially because you have such pride, you can tell you have such pride in relationships, you know. It's critical. Um, so what, a, you obviously, you, you have to keep people too, who, how do you decide what the essential staff are to keep? Like, what, what positions did you end up keeping at that time? Of the 12 staff members that we left go, we kept one. Mm. A young guy, uh, his name is Carlos Ruiz, uh, the young rock star. He just has this sort of analytical mind. Uh, his, his background was in, he, had, he ran a, uh, a couple of soccer stores, and he bought the inventory for the owner of the store. And so he... We, we handed him a category, the exercise and fitness category. Um, at the time, it was doing 10000 in revenue. And we said, we can't, make, we can't figure this out. We don't know what's going on with exercise and fitness. We can't get the sales. We don't know what we're doing wrong. We gave it to him as sort of a training uh, exercise, knowing that he would fail. And then we'd pick him back up by the bootstraps and say, it's OK. No one's been able to do this. But he turned it into a multi-million dollar category for wow. us. Wow. Um, a guy like us who believes in the relationship. Yeah worked with the vendors to get good pricing, is smart, analytical, found the areas that where, where the SKUs were actually making money, and we doubled and tripled down on those mm -hmm. and brought them in by the truckload, brought them in by the container load so that we could get that good pricing. And, and that's how we, we dug out of it. And so now yeah. we've taken what he did and we've, we've expanded it into other categories, some categories that we walked away from that we love, but now we're finally getting back into them again. And we're coming at them with this process that you know that we that we learned internally, mm -hmm. and and uh, you know maybe we would have done it without Carlos, but he's terrific and he's a key member of our team still. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's amazing, Jason, because I have all these questions around how can we boost sales and these you know whatever quote unquote sexy questions, but the real when it comes down to it, it's really about paying special attention to your costs. It, it's look, Jeremy. If you are a private, if you're a public company or a private equity funded company and you've got a hundred million dollars in the bank, go get the sale, do it, you know, grow the market share, get the name out there, spend $50 million on an ad campaign so that everyone knows who you are. Yeah. If you're like us and you're, you're bootstrapping your company and the, the bank won't give you a line of credit so that you can buy your inventory, the only thing that you can focus on is your cost. Yeah. And you can only you you have to make sure that you're making a profit. Yeah. If you're not doing that, I hate to say it, you're just not going to make it. Yeah, it's not going to make it. And so, you know, part of your question is correct, or part of your statement is correct. Cost is 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 
infinitely critical. It's, it's essential if you're a bootstrapped company. If you're going to start your own company and you don't have the financing or you've got some friends and family money, if you don't want to lose all their money, make sure that you find the thing that you, where there's a market where you can make a profit. Uh, because until you hit that IPO, you can't go after, you can't chase that sale. Sales don't matter. Yeah. Yeah. Well, someone, someone asked me one time, a, a, a friend of mine, um, which would you rather do? Would you rather make um, $100,000 on a million dollars in sales or would you rather make $100,000 on $10 million in sales? And at the time, I said, $10 million, man, I want that $10 million. You know, it was, I think it was year three. I want that revenue because when I read Bloomberg or when I read Business it's Week, ego thing. CNBC, these guys are talking about sales growth. Mm. You know, that's, that's, they're talking about all that market share they're eating up. And, and uh, a close friend said, no, that's not where, what you're about. You know, you need to focus on the million dollars in sales that will make you 10%. And that's our profit target mm. always at this point. And we want to, we want to clear at the end of the day when all the bills are paid, we want to net 10% of our, of our revenue. Mm. So, so, you know, and some people would say, Jason, you know, you're re like you said, you're going to be releasing a hundred thousand new SKUs. And I go, yeah. well, you have an advantage, right? Because you've been doing this for 13 years, but what did you do? Because it's still it's still a new skew, right? It's still a new skew. What do you do to make sure that that new skew is is successful? Well, what, what's incredible about the market online marketplaces? So and again, the online marketplaces we push a data feed to Amazon, to Walmart.com, to Sears.com, Rakuten. Um, I'm forgetting three or four others. When you put up a new skew right away, you know if it's going to be a success. Mm. So here's the thing: of the hundred thousand or so SKUs that are in our in our queue uh, with our product team that's now in the Philippines, um, cranking out copy and images to make them, you know, as as uh, to put our best foot forward with each SKU. Not all of those are going to stay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're sort of our initial recon of the market. We get a really good scrape within ninety days from the online marketplaces. Mm -hmm. right? We say, okay, this is selling well. This is not selling well. Um, and and why is that? And then we put it under the microscope and we figure it out. And mm -hmm. sometimes, um, I just came back from a trade show. I'm going to give you a specific example. Yeah. Um, Crosley Turntables. You know this company? They sell these uh, LP record turntables. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We used to do great with that product. We used to do great with it. But what's happened is that Target and Amazon um, and Walmart are selling these things and they're duking it out. And they're going after the market share. Who mm. can sell the most of these turntables? When I look at my cost, even if I bring in a container load from where they're made in Asia and land them and sell them, no matter what I do, I cannot make a profit on it. And I don't think Target is, and I don't think Amazon is. I'm almost positive they're not. But they don't care because they have the funding. Right? They right. have capital. If Amazon yeah. loses too much money on the turntable, they just go sell a few hundred more stock. <laughs> so, you know, so, so, so that's one where we're not going back up with that one. It's something that we've been successful with in the past. It's not a player for us right now. Maybe in the future, if one of those guys wins and they end up, and the prices come back to where we can make a profit on it, then we'll, we'll jump in there again. But it's just one of those things we're going to walk. And I love that product. I think it's so cool. It is such a hip product. I love the sound of LP, but I got to let it go because I can't profit on it. Right. That is tough. Something yeah. that, you know, it's kind of getting to that next, what, what's going to work next? Because that's the scary part is the stuff that worked before may not work in six months. Yeah. Well, it's a, uh, there, there's so much opportunity in yeah. just categories where we're involved, right? Yeah. Uh, sporting goods, we have many sports that we haven't filled out. Um, game tables, it's a pretty full category, but we walked away from some subcategories when we, when we did our cost cutting and we scaled back our resources. Um, toys is one that we've barely dabbled in. Toys is highly competitive, but there's some, there's some nice areas within toys that work for our brand mm -hmm. that I think we can bring to the table. And then, and then backyard and patio is one that we're barely scratching the surface on. So there's so much opportunity out there. Yeah. And what's amazing is we're such a scalable company. You know, uh, we're having this conversation from my home office. Right. I'm telecommuting right now. My offices are now, we, we just signed, I don't know if I told you this, but we, we just brought on our first equity partner. So we did a multi-million dollar. Congratulations. 
Thank you. We just inked the deal in May with a company called Quantum Solutions out of Calabasas, California. They bring a, more than just the money. Um, they bring with us, um, bring to the table for us. They for, I always joke that they've forgotten more about online marketing than we've known, than we know. So they're really going to help us with that. that And, and also their technology. Um, they've got teams to bear for Josh to, to employ to really build out some special features, uh, more brand-specific stuff for us. So, um, How did that so, work? With con- Did they contact you? Were you reaching out? How did that that come out uh, come to play we, well we 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 didn't get any offers in 2013 <laughs> when we lost that million dollars there weren't too that many. was the perfect time for them to grab you though it was the perfect time we, we had some discussions um, we had hired an investment banker um, actually a couple of investment bankers to bring some potential buyers to the table and we just weren't seeing we, we, we knew we had the engine and the driver and we knew how to fix it but we hadn't fixed it yet Right. And we just didn't see the value and we're going to have to give up too much of our company. But everything changed in 2014. 20% growth with four people in a virtual outsourced army of, of staff that is cost effective. Um, and that profit on the bottom line changes everything for someone bringing out an investor. So, you know, we were able to give up, you know, a minority stake of the, of the company in exchange for capital that will really help us catapult and build on that momentum that we started in 2014. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what do you see the biggest challenges going forward? Oof. This is one of the things that I both love and hate about e-commerce is it's incredibly competitive incredibly fierce. The things that Amazon is doing and some of these other big guys, I uh, never even thought of some of the things that these guys are doing. Like I, what? What's something that you've I seen? I buy groceries from Amazon. You know, I just had my groceries delivered to my front door this morning and they're amazing. You know, Amazon Fresh. The things that they're doing with e-commerce is, is incredible. They're, they're building out a services division where they can have anything that you buy assembled for you. Uh, because if my customers are like me and many of them are, you can't, they don't know how to use a screwdriver. Forget about it. Yeah. Forget about it. <laughs> so the, the, the competition, you never know. I never know when I'm going to open up my inbox or go to internetretailer.com and see something new that makes a lot of sense that we didn't think of. Right. So it's fiercely competitive. There's an incredible downward pressure on pricing. So... And, and, and I'll fully admit, the things that helped us get out of the troubles of 2013 and have a successful 2014 and have a monster, we're, having, we're at 80% growth right now uh, through, through this year. Um, the things that have worked, they may not work in six months. Right. You know? yeah. so it, that's what I don't like about it, but it's also what I really like about it because it keeps us on our toes. We can't rest on our laurels and say, oh, just, we got an investor, we're just going to kick back now and count our money. It just doesn't work that way online because it's so fiercely competitive. Yeah. Jason, how do you evaluate new opportunity? Because like you said, you always have to be looking what's next. Well, we we try to keep it simple. Uh, And and I mentioned the phrase, we turn down the noise. Uh, It's a double-edged sword when you look at what's new and exciting out there because, you know, something that is very exciting on internet retailer may be like something that makes perfect sense for us. But if I look at my resources at the time, and the projects that are in the queue, we may have to take a pass on it, which means we're going to be late, right? We're going to be later than our competitors. Mm-hmm. But we're, we're really focused on keeping the thing simple. Look, we list products for sale on our website. We try to give our customers as much information as possible to help them with their buying decision, and we try to have a fair price. Then once they buy, we try to get it to their house in one piece. And we're constantly focusing on doing those things. Mm-hmm. And it seems very simple. Right, you can put it on a whiteboard, and it's you know two lines, but all of the all of the details and points that are required to get that to happen are are onerous, and so we don't ever want to take our ball off of that. Right. If we do that, and we can't do the simple things, then no matter what kind of fancy new bell or whistle that we add to our e-commerce platform, our site, it won't work. So that's something that we're we're also doubling down on is 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 really refocusing constantly and building the processes where we're constantly improving all of those areas. Yeah. It's something that may work today, you know, that may, may not work so great later for various reasons. Mm-hmm. So what's been the proudest moment? Obviously, we've seen a, a bunch of ups and downs, but what's been the proudest? 
You know, I, I think the proudest moments are yet to come, but the proudest moment to date, um, I, I think when when we were able to sign that deal in May with really good people, with a lot of expertise that fills in the gaps that we don't have, and they looked at our business and they said, we value you guys, mm. and we value you at this, um, and we signed that deal, um, that 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 was really our proudest proudest moment, followed by looking at the P&L in 2014 and not crying. Actually, I was crying, but I was in crying reason that I was when I looked at it <laughs> your, your prior right. just all of the I mean yeah. the nights and the long nights and in 2014 to, just to pour salt in the wound my my youngest daughter Ellie she was born with a kidney defect so oh. she, she had to have a partial, partial nephrectomy in March oh. and she developed a bad infection at the hospital in wow. UCLA wow. so in the midst of four people running an eight million dollar business I had to leave and be with my daughter for three weeks while she got better and um, I think it's just the most difficult year I've ever had um, but, Jeez. but but those are the things that those are the things that build character right and those that's where the, the Marines came into play right the Marines came into play they absolutely yeah. do just when you think you just can't take anymore Jeez. throw <laughs> Ellie on there yeah just <laughs> throw that on there that's horrible yeah, uh, uh, the good news is is that she's just healthy as can be oh, you yeah. never know she had a surgery and that's amazing She's, yeah. you know, her and Maddie are just the, the greatest joys of my life. Yeah, that's what matters I most. Imagine. I know you've got a four-year-old and a two-year-old That's yourself. what matters most right there. So, yes. yeah. yeah. You know, Jason, I really appreciate your time. This has been fantastic. I have one last question uh, before sure. I ask it. Just tell people where should they go or should they check out your, uh, your company? Oh, Dazzity.com. If you want fun things for your home, if you want to create a staycation, don't spend three grand and go to Hawaii. Spend a couple of grand and put together a game room in your home or a basketball court in your yeah. home that you can enjoy every day of the year. Yeah. Uh, and you can go to Dazzy.com. It's D-A-Z-A-D-I.com. Yeah. And if you have any questions, you can pick up the phone and you can talk to someone who knows about the product. Yeah. We'll deliver it to your home. We'll even install it for you if you need it. Yeah. And, and Jason, I attest to that because I was having actually a conversation with my wife the other day, and I'm like, you know the best purchase we made in our house? I'm like, the basketball hoop. Oh. That is the best purchase we made. <laughs> and I, maybe she disagreed with it, but that was my personal. You know, I can't she tell actually you, agreed with it. I can't tell you yeah. how many Saturdays I spent playing basketball and how many weekdays after school or after college I spent yeah. bonding with my brothers playing basketball. Yeah. And, and having those games like a foosball table where you can actually look across the table and see the other person's eyes and talk to them yeah. is is real value. We valued it growing up. It was part of it, it was part of what made us who we are, and we love sharing that with our customers. Yeah. We absolutely love it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Jason. So my last question is this: Since it's this Hubani Commerce Mastery Series, my question sure. to you is, where, what should we leave people with with e-commerce? We talked about a lot of different aspects what should be what you know the last takeaway well I, I I think I think there's there's a there's three things right yeah. number one turn down the noise and keep it simple mm -hmm. don't chase the latest bell and whistle if the basics aren't working optimally right turn down the noise know who you are because don't go chasing Amazon if you don't have the funding to do it because it's a it's a rest, it's a path to ruin. Right. Uh, number two, watch those financials. If you don't know how your financials work, hire a good accountant to train you or take a course. You have got to know that P and L and the balance sheet, yeah. and you got to make sure that at the end of the day, that net profit is is not doesn't have a big negative sign in front of it. Right. So if you're a bootstrap company, if you're not doing the things that'll do that, you're not going to stick around, and you're just not going to be there. One just one side note on item number two before I go to the final point is yeah. paying attention on a high growth company when you start growing at a double digit, we're we're pushing triple digit right now. Focus on the cost as a percentage of your sale. Right. Make sure that those, if you if you're selling for a dollar, make sure that after your profit is left over and your your rent and whatever other your salary expenses are, make sure that, that there's still something left of that dollar after everything has been paid for. Yeah. So, um, and then you know the, the the last thing for a bootstrap company that I would recommend is know your resources. Right. It kind of doubles with number one where you can't go chasing Amazon, but. Mm -hmm. 
I, I'm going to leave you with one last story about the Marines. Yeah. Many of those Marine stories. Yes, so, yes. <laughs> one of the exercises in Quantico that we did is we had these terrain model tables. It was a table on wheels, and it was just a wood box, and it had sand, right? And so one of the ways that we trained for our missions was the captain would come over and say, here's your mission, lieutenant. Um, attack the hill. And so you would take the tr you would take your topographical map, and you would build out, it was like playing in dirt, which was one of the, another great benefits of being in the Marines. <laughs> You'd build up your terrain map, map uh, on this table topographically. And one of the best lessons I, I ever learned was from, from, uh, from Captain Scott. He gave me the mission to attack the hill, and I put together this very elaborate plan that included close air support from a Harrier jump jet, uh, you know, artillery fire from, uh, from a naval carrier, <laughs> helicopter support, gun support. I mean, the, the hill wasn't left after I put this thing up. It was, it was basically flat land. But he says, that's a really great detailed plan, Lieutenant, but here's the problem. You don't have close air support. There's no artillery within, you know, a thousand miles. There is no naval ship off the coast. You're on your own. Now make the plan. So then I had to look at what my resources were. Mm -hmm. I had to see that I only had 30 Marines. And of those 30 Marines, I only had so many machine guns. I had so many M16s, you know, and I had so many explosives with me. So I had to take a look at the resources that I had and then develop a mission to attack that hill. Yeah. Because the greatest plan that you can make is only as good as the resources that you have to bring to bear. When you're watching CNBC and you hear these great stories about these crazy growth patterns and everything, before you go chasing them, make sure that you have the resources in order to fulfill that mission and that plan. Yeah. Jason, it's been an absolute pleasure. I hope one day we get to play basketball together. Jeremy, you gotta come. You gotta come for a Shabbos dinner next time you're in Los Angeles for sure. And I, I, I also want to just say, I. Uh, another double-edged sword. I've been looking at your website lately, and you have such great content. Oh, on thank your site. you. The only problem is, is after my kids go to sleep, I'm coming on my computer and my iPad, and I'm watching all this, and I'm sleep deprived right now. <laughs> I blame you, Jeremy. So Not compared to the Marine days. So. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Great work. I love that content. I appreciate, it, Jason. Absolute pleasure. Thank you, Jeremy. Take care.